The next chapter we'll cover will be chapter 14. In this chapter, we're going to take a look at some of the terminology used with antimicrobial drugs. We'll do a little bit with the history of where these antimicrobials came from, how they were discovered. And I want to show you a little bit about how these drugs can work for us. Let's start with just a little terminology and a little bit about history. Now the first term on this slide is chemotherapy. Chemotherapy very often is thought of in relation to its treatment of cancer, but the term chemotherapy is actually a term which means use of chemicals or drugs to treat a disease. So if you really look at the definition of this term, I think you may realize that we've all used some sort of chemotherapy at some point in our life. We, most of us have had some sort of sickness in which we've taken a chemical drug to treat. Now the title of this chapter is antimicrobial drugs. Antimicrobial drugs are specific chemotherapy agents. They are drugs that target disease caused by infectious microbes. And since we're in a microbiology class, the chemotherapy we're discussing is really focusing more on antimicrobial drugs. Now, as we look at the history of antimicrobials, we really only have to go back into the early 1900s to begin this discussion. The very first scientist that is really um, credited with identifying an antimicrobial would be Paul Ehrlich. He was responsible for figuring out you could take a compound that contains arsenic. Now, arsenic is a very dangerous chemical, but he figured out that if you gave the correct amount of arsenic, it could actually kill trypanema pallidum, which is the bacterial causative agent of syphilis. So he actually was able to cure syphilis in patients by giving them doses of a chemical called arsenic. Now that is an example of an antimicrobial. It was about 20 years later when the first natural antibiotic was discovered, and that was discovered by accident by Alexander Fleming. Alexander Fleming had some bacteria growing on a petri dish. When he came back from vacation, he noticed he had some mold growing on his petri dishes. So he actually kind of made a mistake in a way by contaminating his petri dish, but he had a very intelligent thought before he threw away those contaminated petri dishes. He noticed that where the mold was growing, there was no bacteria growing anymore. So he started doing some research and he actually figured out that the mold was producing a chemical in which he called penicillin. And then later other people were able to purify that penicillin from the mold and really give us our first widely used antibiotic. One more scientist that needs some credit here is um, Gerard Dogma. Dog Dalmach, I say that name funny, I apologize, but he, about 10 years later, he used the knowledge from Alexander Fleming to take um, and create his own antibiotic. So where Fleming identified the first natural antibiotic, this particular individual created what we call a synthetic antimicrobial agent. This was the very first sulfa drug, and I have a feeling that most of you have probably taken a sulfa drug at some point in your life to cure a microbial infection, really commonly sinus infections and things of that nature. Most of the antimicrobials that we take now are actually considered semi-synthetic antimicrobials. A lot of times natural antibiotics will be modified chemically and then that modification makes it semi-synthetic. A great example of that would be ampicillin, where they take the natural penicillin, modify it chemically, and we get ampicillin. If we want to look at types of antimicrobial drugs, there's really two major groups that we want to consider. We want to think about the narrow spectrum antimicrobials and the broad spectrum antimicrobials. Now, as the name suggests, um, they're classified by whether or not they're killing one particular group of bacteria or just a large variety of bacteria. With the narrow spectrum antimicrobials, 
this is going to be a drug that is targeting a very specific small subset group of bacteria. We can use narrow spectrum antibiotics when we know exactly which bacteria is causing the disease. These are very useful because we know we will only kill that one particular bacteria. When we compare this to a broad spectrum antimicrobial that is targeting a very large variety of bacterial pathogens, we have to understand that these broad spectrum antimicrobials are they're going to kill the bacteria that's making us sick, but they're also going to kill other bacteria. Some of them may be bad, but they may kill some of our normal, natural bacteria that live on us. So broad spectrum antibiotics are, are very, very important. We use those when we have mixed infections, resistant strains, um, but the broad spectrum antimicrobials can be bad if they're misused and kill too much of the normal microbiota, we can end up with what's called a super infection and even lead to antibiotic resistant bacteria, which can be quite dangerous. We're going to talk about those at the end of the lecture. So let's think about how these antimicrobials are administered. When antimicrobials are administered, we have to consider dosage. Dosage is just simply the amount of medicine we give. We got to figure out how much of our antimicrobial we need to give that is going to kill what we want to kill, but we don't want to give too much because we don't want any side effects to happen. So a lot of research has to go in before we can prescribe antimicrobials to make sure that we're giving the correct amount of the drug needed. When we are looking at children, very often we are much more careful with our dosage because the mass of the child is, is really going to play a huge role there. We also have to consider the drug half-life, and this is just a fancy way of saying how long is this drug going to remain in our system. When we're administering antimicrobials, there's three main routes that we will use. An oral route, this simply means taking the antimicrobial and ingesting it through the mouth. Um, these are very easy to administer. That's the good part. But if you take a drug orally, it has to pass through your esophagus, your stomach, has to make it through your stomach acid, has to get into your intestines sometimes. So you have to think about how that drug is going to interact with the gastrointestinal tract. The second route of administration is topical. This really is only going to work for a superficial or topical infection. Topical is um, like when you take a cream and rub it on your skin. That's usually not going to be very efficiently capable of penetrating through the skin. The third route is probably one of the most important, and that's the parenteral route. Parenteral is a fancy way of saying intravenous, which means putting something directly into the blood or intramuscular, putting something directly into the muscle. A lot of times we can get the um, quickest effect by placing the antimicrobial into the system at the parenteral route. So this um, picture comes from your textbook and this is just an explanation of the common ways that antibacterial drugs work specifically. Some of our antibacterial drugs are going to attack the cell wall of the bacteria. So if you think about this, we learned about cell walls. So we know that bacterial cell walls are made of a chemical called peptidoglycan. This is unique to bacteria. So if we can create an antimicrobial that will attack peptidoglycan only, it's going to leave all of our eukaryotic cells alone. Plasma membrane. Um, Antibacterials will affect the plasma membrane. Typically, they're going to um, block some of the functions of the membrane, not necessarily damaging the membrane itself. Antibacterial drugs can bind to ribosomes and affect protein synthesis. You may remember that bacterial ribosomes are smaller than eukaryotic ribosomes, so it's a good way for us to target bacteria only. And then we do also have some drugs that will affect the metabolic processes, including DNA and RNA synthesis for our bacteria. 
Now on this next slide, I've listed a few of these different types um, of drugs and classified it by the action in which the antibacterial drug will, will use. I don't expect you to memorize every drug, but what I wanted you to do was perhaps look at some of these and realize you may recognize. The um, inhibitors of cell wall biosynthesis, that includes our beta-lactams and our very first natural antibiotic, penicillin, fits in there. Other inhibitors of cell wall biosynthesis would be vancomycin, probably something that sounds familiar. If we move down to our protein biosynthesis inhibitors, we have azithromycin, doxycycline, streptomycin, again, very common antibiotics. Um, and then this last one, inhibitors of our metabolic pathways, the sulfa drugs. It's a very, very commonly gr common group of antimicrobials that are prescribed. And then another slide. This is a list of some common antimicrobials that affect microbes that are causing disease other than bacteria. So just a couple of antifungals that disrupt cell membrane. We have um, the imidazoles and the polyenes. Imidazoles like triazole and fluconazole, those are commonly used for fungal infections, um, yeast infections, things like that. Nystatin, very commonly used for yeast infections, diaper rash. Um, some antiprotozoans and antihelmythics, probably a little less familiar with. If you have pets or livestock, you may recognize this ivermectin. It's commonly given to puppies to prevent worm infections. And then I've listed a few antivirals here. Acyclovir, that's the one that is used for your herpes type viruses, so people that have fever blisters. Um, AZT is a antimicrobial used for malaria. And then Tamiflu, I'm sure you all recognize that one. It helps to minimize the effects of the flu. So our last slide in this chapter that we want to talk about is drug resistance. Drug resistance occurs as microbes evolve. Typically, if the microbes evolve in the presence of an antimicrobial, they can become resistant to that antimicrobial. And then we can end up with a very, very big problem. If we have a disease-causing agent that causes pretty devastating diseases, and it's resistant to the drugs we have to kill that microbe, and that microbe is going to be a huge problem for patients. Some of the things that can lead to drug resistance would be overuse or misuse of antimicrobials. How many of you have ever been prescribed an antibiotic and not taken the entire dosage? Well, think about what we talked about with dosage. That has been carefully measured and determined to make sure you're taking the right amount of the drug so it stays in your system the correct amount of time. If you stop taking your antibiotics, you could be exposing that microbe to the drug so it can develop resistance. Um, one of the most common drug-resistant bacteria that you'll hear about is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and that's what we call MRSA. It's a pretty nasty infection that any of you that work in the healthcare field need to become familiar with because you're going to see it in your future.